Ladies and gentle ghouls, welcome to the final episode of our Let's Dev Halloween special. Now, last episode, we deviated from the norm and took a look at the art and visuals for Sweet Spooks. We also covered how they play into the overall feel of the game. And today, we continue to deviate from the norm with yet another look at the game, this time focusing on the secrets hidden within. And in case it needs to be said, yes, this episode contains spoilers for Sweet Spooks. So I highly recommend you guys check out the game for yourself and see if you can figure out the secrets for yourself. Then come back and watch the video. And if you do, be sure to let me know in the comments section. I'd really like to know how well I did with the design of the experience. So with that said, let's get to the secrets. So right off the bat, Sweet Spooks main focus is pretty messed up. Stalking innocent children before scaring them into dropping their candy. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty horrible, as I'm sure some of you may have already noticed. What's interesting though is because it's seen as quote unquote just a game, the idea of scaring children for their candy doesn't seem that bad. And that's sort of deliberate and part of the overall design concept for Sweet Spooks. Now, it's not my intention to sound like I created some grandiose concept that's going to change the industry forever. I just wanted to try something that toyed with the idea of there being more beneath the surface. I honestly don't blame anyone for taking one look at Sweet Spooks and just passing, because the overall style is purposely mundane. The gameplay itself is ordinary and the monochrome visuals mean nothing in particular ever draws the eye of the player. Even the location is nothing special, the suburbs are notorious for being mundane and boring. The children dress in typical Halloween gear and hey, you get the idea. But there are several places that aren't so mundane that are tucked between the clean and safe. And it's here that I hope people start to pay attention. Why are there some areas completely destroyed and seemingly in the dark? Why are there so many cars in the Mart's parking lot? What about that house at the edge of the map that no one seems to visit? And what's up with that roadside memorial? It's my hope that by providing just a few notable weird spots, that would be enough to encourage some exploration. The player starts in a dark shed. It's busted down, covered in debris and garbage. Was it always this way? The children deliberately used the sidewalks, only stepping on the road when using a crosswalk. Was that for realism, or was there another reason for that? And for the sake of the lore, we'll just assume the kids who keep running into walls are, you know, just having a hard time seeing through their costumes and thus are unable to navigate the town properly. Anyway, I was hopeful that the few nuggets planted would be enough to warrant further exploration. And I'm almost willing to bet that most will miss one huge nugget because almost every player ignores them. The instructions. Again, pretty straightforward and mundane, all except for the controls, which list F as the interact button. What? It's here that I'm not sure about my design decisions and where I think it could use improvement in the future. The only things relevant to the ghost and by extension the player have depth. Walls and buildings have depth, children have depth, and the interactables have depth. I feel like the clue to interactivity was arguably way too subtle. But I also assumed some desperate folk might just smash F, which is why I placed a giant piece of candy, one of the interactables, right next to the exit. From there, I put a lot of faith into the player to explore all their options, which hopefully leads them to the memorial. The thing is, interacting with a roadside memorial isn't that weird to me, but I'm also entirely aware that that could be a cultural thing and maybe lost in the translation. But as a backup, I hope someone would press F to pay respects at the memorial. And assuming players figure out that they can interact with the memorial after picking up the candy interactable, they are rewarded with a ton of candy. This was done for two reasons. First, by this point, if the player is on this path, I wanted to make it abundantly clear that the main quote unquote gameplay is no longer a concern. This should feel like hitting the jackpot otherwise, because generally the amount of candy gained per run is pretty low. And second, I really wanted to drive home the fact that this interaction was significant. Which brings us back to the starting area and the real subtle depth of the bottle. The true key, the catalyst to discovering answers. Indeed, taking the bottle to the memorial is basically what all the clues are meant to lead to. I try to allude to this as much as possible beforehand without being too obvious. No cars on the street, all parked in the mart, the mart itself displaying a bottle on its sign. And if you've played this far, you know what happens when placing the bottle into the memorial. I'm gonna leave the scenario out of this video just in case you haven't, and we'll just skip to the aftermath. 
So in the aftermath, the player is locked behind the Memorial, now in darkness. I wanted to make this sequence longer, but time restraints plus fear of people assuming that they broke the game meant I decided to keep this pretty short. So yeah, events occur, which if you're lucky, may play out somewhat differently sometimes before kicking the player back to the main title with a new screen, which suggests that there's more to discover. And what comes next is all about subverting expectations while also providing even more lore. Not only does the player find that the gameplay has completely changed, but so has parts of the map. These changes help to tie up the final bits of lore to be found. And what players find at the game over screen is also pretty significant. Again, there's some reaching to be done here, but I was hopeful that attentive players would notice that their dropped candy lured nearby children, and also that there's only one location they can be lured to that'll put the new game over screen into context. And that, my friends, is the final major bit of lore to be found in Sweet Spooks. So what does it all mean? Well, uh, that's up to interpretation, and I don't mean that as a way to avoid making any kind of statement on the story. Through the information gathered, it's pretty obvious that players are indeed not playing as a good person. This town has obviously been damaged, and given how it has reacted to all the actions the player takes to get this far, it should be pretty clear that the ghost is involved somehow. So while Sweet Spooks provides a lot of clues, the absolute truth is muddled by the chaos that's been tucked away. And that's where I say it's up for interpretation. But in case you need something concrete, I will confirm that the ghost, the character players play as, was was not a good person. So yeah, this simple, seemingly mundane and innocent score attack game secretly has a story about a horrible individual buried deep within it, much like this town seems to be trying to bury its own darkness. And with all that said, there are a few subtleties I wanted to go over. As I said in the previous episode, detail was important, and I wanted to take advantage of the fact that I was going with a higher fidelity with Sweet Spooks. The art itself is pretty consistent, lines are solid and maintain the same look throughout, however the children's lines never exhibit any sharp edges, suggesting that they are no real threat. And while the same can be said for the world's edges, the world's lines aren't straight or consistent, suggesting that despite how pristine and nice they try to make it look, it's clearly shook and not as stable as they may seem. And as for the player character, the ghost is the only character or object in the entire game to feature distinctively sharp edges, which suggests from the very beginning no less that this character is dangerous. The ghost shape also resembles a bottle in a paper bag turned upside down, with the bolted slash torn edges of the bag resembling teeth or tentacles maybe. And no matter which way it's facing, the ghost's crooked little smile never changes. And as for the isometric view, I thought it served well with the concept of having to strategically stalk the children before scaring them. Growing up personally, isometric games for me were mostly strategy games, and so I thought it added to the twistedness of the concept. And finally, did you notice there's a house in particular that no children visit? And I'm not talking about the broken down house either. Yeah, a little extra lore for you there. And so finally, we come to the end of the Let's Dev Halloween special. I'm sure I'm forgetting a few tidbits of info, but you get the idea. I'm pretty happy with the final results, so I hope you not only enjoyed the game for yourself, but also enjoyed this little mini-series as well. So remember that if you like this video or enjoy Let's Dev in general, be sure to hit that like button. If you aren't already subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button, and be sure to turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode. And as always, be sure to leave your spooky thoughts on Sweet Spooks in the comment section below. Seriously, I would love to know what you guys thought of this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.